And so Carolina is the first one seed to go out. The Crimson Tide will now face Clemson, who also knocked off a big team yesterday, knocking out the two seed Arizona. So the one and the two going down in the West. Both these teams seeking their first ever Final Four appearance. And I mentioned as I bring Uncle Seth into the conversation here, we know Alabama as an offensive team. They average 90 points a game, but they played some good defense last night, and that's why they're still kicking. Are they headed to the Final Four? They can play their way to the Final Four if they continue to defend the way they did. I thought they were absolutely incredible defensively. And, you know, their defensive game plan, everyone talks about Nate Oates as an offensive genius. And he, what he does offensively, the space they play with, the pace they play with is great. But to me, it's the defense that they played yesterday. They didn't guard Elliott Cano. They had Grant Nelson, their 6'11", 7-foot wingspan post player in the middle of the lane, helping on R.J. Davis, helping on dribble penetration, helping on Armando Baycott. That was the difference in this basketball game. Yeah, R.J. Davis was 0 for 9 from the three-point line, but it was the defensive game plan of Nate Oates that literally controlled the tempo of the game for, for UNC's offense. They took the perimeter game out because of how they defended uh, Elliott Cadeau. I'll give you a projection. It's funny, and one has nothing to do with the other. Nick Saban leaves Alabama, right. retires. Now Alabama basketball will get to the Final Four. I'm going to have them in the Final Four. Love the way this team defends. Love the style in Nick? which they play. Excuse me? You blaming it on Nick Saban? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Nick Saban, Nate Oates, <laughs> Alabama headed to the Final Four. Go ahead, finish it. Yes. It's, it's the, it, look, Clemson's a really good basketball team. Chase Hunter is playing his tail off. But it's the way Mark Sears, it's the way really, it's the way these guys are knocking down shots, and it's the way they're defending. This is a different team. Now, this team almost, almost had a chance to beat Arizona early in the year when I think they shot like two of 38 uh -huh. from the three-point line. They almost won that game. So when they're knocking down shots and they're playing defense, dangerous team. Again, Arizona goes out last night, so it's Alabama Clemson for a spot in the Final Four. Andrea, I know you put together some tape on how you see them trying to attack Caitlin Clark and knock her out here in the Sweet 16. Well, Greeny, first of all, it's easier said than done, but shout out to Hembo. We found some things that definitely make Caitlin Clark struggle more than others. But let me just start with she is so difficult to guard. But here's what we found. When she rejects screens, she scores 59% of the time. So what do you want to do? You want to make her use the ball screen. West Virginia is an elite defensive team, so the screen's coming. You see how you are forcing her to the left. The screener's defender has to be up, and you have to make life difficult on Caitlin Clark and crowd her space. But making mm. her use the screen is the first thing. Her scoring rate goes from 59 to 39 when she has to use the ball screen. 59% of the time to 39% of the time. You'll take those chances. And then here, you want to force her to her non-dominant hand. That is her left hand. So as a defender, you want to get up on her right side, shade that side, force her left. When she is going left, she only draws fouls 12% of the time. When she's going right, she draws fouls 27% of the time. So you hmm. want to make her use the screen and you want to make her go left. Here's where it's difficult, Greeny. Sometimes making her use the screen means making her go right. So that's where as a defender you start to get confused because you're like, wait, I want her to use the screen, but I want her to go left. And you start countering yourself as you're remembering how you want to guard her. You have to pick your poison. There are some things that work in your favor, but sometimes those things counter each other. And that's where as a defender it's really easy to have mental lapses. You also just can't let it get to you when she hits tough shots. Against West Virginia, she had over 30 points, but she was 30% from the field. She's going to hit yeah. some tough ones. You've got to make her inefficient, as inefficient as possible. She hasn't been dominant in the first two games, even though the numbers have looked somewhat dominant. How do you assess right now, for those who don't follow the sport closely, her chances of getting back to the Final Four? She needs a win tomorrow and then Monday. Caitlin Clark and Iowa's chances getting to the Final Four are highly unlikely, in my opinion. I have them beating Colorado. West Virginia is such an elite team defensively that people are taking this West Virginia game and they're giving a lot of credit to Iowa and Caitlin Clark's struggle. West Virginia is really good defensively. They led all Power 5 teams last season, this past season, in steals per game. They're elite. Colorado's not as elite defensively. They do have some better scores, that being Colorado. But I see Iowa getting past Colorado. I do not have Iowa or Caitlin Clark, the two of them together, getting past LSU or UCLA. Mm.
Iowa is such an undersized team, Greeny. Like, and when you're watching this West Virginia game, West Virginia is not an elite offensive rebounding team. West Virginia doesn't have a lot of size. Those are two things that UCLA and LSU both have, and they have readily available. Angel Reese, Anissa Morrow, that's for LSU. Lauren Betts is 6'7 at UCLA. So the size of both of those teams I see giving Iowa trouble if they get past Colorado, which is still a coin flip for me. If I said it's the UConn Invitational, is that an appropriate description of this year's men's tournament? 100%. I completely agree with Coach. This is the UConn Invitational. And you know what? As I was sitting here thinking about it and listening to Coach talk about Connecticut, the only team that has shown that level of dominance is the South Carolina Gamecocks on the women's side. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what we're looking at. Coach, when you talk about Dan Hurley and the way he's able to impact his UConn Huskies, that is the exact same scenario with Dawn Staley and her South Carolina Gamecocks. And it's not just that they dominate – defensively it's not just that they dominate offensively they dominate in both as I'm watching both of these teams play coach think about this both teams in their last win have 50 or more rebounds both teams have 19 or more offensive rebounds both teams have 38 points in the paint both teams have six players score in double figures the similarities between these two teams not just from their coaches but from the top down on both sides of the floor is remarkable they are both elite. We're seeing dominance from the Gamecocks. We're seeing dominance from the Huskies. That's a really well-made point. And, and so let's actually do this. Let's put the two of them together. You've had South Carolina. They've been the best team on the women's side all year. UConn, the best team on the men's side all year. Andrea, I'll start with you on the women's side. Who's the biggest threat? I mean, America all knows Caitlin Clark, so they will probably immediately go to Iowa. But in your mind, if a team is going to beat South Carolina, who's the likeliest suspect? You know, this is, this is really tough because I don't see a threat. I don't see one, and that may be the biggest difference. There might be a threat for UConn on the men's side. I don't see one, Greeny, for the Gamecocks on the women's side. When South Carolina plays their best basketball, it's just not – close the way they get out in transition the way they hit threes the size that they have on the inside the way they have multiple threats multiple scores and for South Carolina and this might be the biggest difference on the men's side and the women's side South Carolina's speed and athleticism paired with their skill will 100 percent set them apart that's the difference maker on the women's side that isn't close fair enough so let's go to the men if someone's going to beat UConn who's it going to be I think Illinois has a legitimate shot. That's who they play next, by the way. I Illinois do. beat Iowa State last year. I time. do. But if Dan Hurley, he has to close the deal. Think about, we might be talking about one of the greatest coaches to ever live in the game of college basketball. Dan Hurley? Yes. I think that is what's on the line right now here. If you're talking about him winning back-to-back -back championships at this stage of his career, being that young with, like as Seth said, two completely different rosters mm -hmm. in the span of – Two seasons. Yeah. One of the most dominant coaches to ever coach the game. Think about how many coaches have two. Yeah. Like, and he's going to have two in back-to-back -back years, Seth. That's where we're going with Dan Hurley if they can close the deal. Quickly, though, Seth, same question to you. If, if UConn's going to get beat, who's going to beat him? I think Purdue. I think Purdue's the only one that has a shot. I'm saying they're not Purdue. They're Purdue. Uh, Purdue can control the tempo of the game. They're going to play through Edie. He's impossible to game plan for. If you double him, they're going to kick it back out. I think they, they won't turn it over. They can make enough threes. you got to be able to score against these guys. They're going to score. They're going to get extra possessions potentially on the glass. Look, I think UConn's the best team in the country, but if I had to pick one team, I think it would be Purdue because of Edie. He's just different. He's so hard to game plan for because you've never seen anyone like him.